On today's show, I'm joined by Taylor Chamberlain, and we're talking all about saddle hunting, urban whitetails. Thank you for tuning in to the Northeast Region's Headquarters for Hunting-Related Stories and Tactics, sourced from DIY hunters and industry insiders. This is Hunting the Empire. Now here's your host, Joe Mainville. Welcome to another episode of the Hunting the Empire podcast. This is episode 19. My name is Joe, host, founder of the Hunting the Empire podcast. I appreciate you tuning in. And again, on today's show, I'm joined by Taylor Chamberlain. Uh, goes by Urban Bowman, and all he hunts are is urban areas of Washington, D.C. So it's going to be a great conversation. We get into a lot of the details of kind of how he gets it done and why he does it, all about the management and and everything else that goes into urban style hunting. I really enjoyed having Taylor on, so I'm I'm positive that you all are going to find some really good nuggets of information in here. I know myself, I've never really hunted kind of urban like he does. Um, I've got an area that I grew up in, you know, south of me about an hour that has uh, a real deer density problem that's um, probably similar to what Taylor has down there in D.C., but I don't think quite to the level that he is. But I've done some management, uh, you know, doe management and stuff in the uh, local municipalities around there for like a, a local university and um, and some of the other, uh, like the DNR and DC areas around there that they designate that's a, a higher deer density areas that they give extra permits for. And, uh, so I've done like a style of, um, you know, that, but most of the areas that I'm able to get in there are like on the back side of, uh, like state parks and stuff like that. So it's not really, uh, people's backyards. Uh, per se, but it is getting a little closer than what I'm used to. And uh, that stuff's pretty interesting. It, it's definitely different. So uh, Taylor and I also talk quite a bit about uh, saddle hunting. So because that's how he's getting it done. So I think you're going to get some good information out of that. And uh, I guess we'll just get right into today's show. And here we go. All right. And on the line with me today, I've got Taylor Chamberlain of down in the the dc area how we doing taylor hey i'm great how are you good man um i guess let's so we've been john before we finally hit record so i want to kind of pick up a little bit where we left off but before we dive into these conversations um can you give a little background for us uh kind of who you are kind of your style of hunting and, and maybe even what you do for a living yeah, absolutely. So my name's Taylor Chamberlain. Uh, I'm an urban bow hunter. So um, I live in the Northern Virginia area of the suburbs of Washington, D.C. So I live about 10 minutes outside of the city. And, um, you know, we have a humongous deer problem here that we can get into. But what that affords me is the opportunity to hunt year round. Uh, so I hunt anywhere from 150 to 200 and 25 plus days a year so uh this last calendar year uh, i will have hunted well over 230 days in a tree um i'm a real estate developer by trade uh but i also do some media production stuff in the outdoor industry and um you know I, i'm kind of an anal um or very anal and and uh, pretty analytical guy so in hunting that many days a year i've really gotten a chance to try pretty much anything and everything that's on the market. And uh, I think I've kind of perfected the system here. So I'm happy to go into deep detail on it. Yeah, we'll definitely dive into that. Um, first, I want to let's kind of as a reference, a point of reference for everybody listening. We know that you hunt urban areas in D.C., but maybe people haven't visited D.C. and and have maybe some idea of what like the 
you know, some of the major landmarks might look like, but in, in the areas that you're hunting, what's, what's the, uh, the landscape look like? That's a great question. So I'm obviously not hunting the concrete jungle of Washington, DC, because, um, there are very few deer in there, just kind of some of the parks. Uh, but so outside of DC, we have some rolling topography and, we have a ton of urban sprawl. And so a typical property for me would be, you know, they build all these developments where they develop all the available land, but they don't develop in the creek beds, for example, or, or the kind of waterways that are natural because of the rolling topography. So a typical place that I hunt would be like a one acre lot, or I have some properties that are as small as a quarter acre but they're all the lots that back up to the to the creek systems because the deer tend to run those creek systems because of the fact that they're not developed and you know the water provides for good forage and cover so the deer will literally run those like a highway so i'm hunting in the neighborhoods of quarter to 1 acre lots um back in the backyards literally where they're overgrown with trees and um you know, surrounded by houses. Have you, um, did you grow up in that area? I did. Yeah. I'm born and raised here. So, um, this is really kind of all I know. It's, it's natural to me. Uh, I, I actually come from a family where nobody hunts, uh, nobody hunts deer. So I grew up not hunting. Um, my family, we do the traditional Virginian dove hunt on opening day of the season, so we used to go out and shoot birds as kids, and uh, my brothers and I would be the bird dogs. So we would run out and pick up all the doves that would uh, get shot by dad and grandpa and uncle and all those guys. And um, But I, I'd never been exposed to deer hunting. I went to college out in western Virginia, and I played golf in college. And my teammates, a couple of my teammates were really into hunting. And um, they would talk about it, and I just felt like I had this natural – desire to hunt so i took all the hunter safety courses and all that and um and just really got you know just went out and started hunting myself and i would go out and hunt and i'd screw it up and i'd come back and i'd try to figure out how i screwed it up and i mean just kept going out after it and i read every book available every magazine available trying to just soak up any and all information on whitetail hunting and basically taught myself how to hunt. And when I graduated from college, I, I didn't have anywhere to hunt when I moved back here to the city. Um, and we have a military base that is uh, about 30 minutes south of us. It's a huge chunk of land and they have a big deer problem and, and they have a, um, you know, program where they go in and, and hunt the deer. And so I went down there and started bow hunting there and, and just, you know, only hunting on Saturdays because at the time we couldn't hunt on Sundays in Virginia. And so I would go out, you know, two hours before sunrise on Saturday morning and I'd sit all day and, you know, probably harvest deer here and there. But I really had had no clue what I was doing and just kept teaching myself and learning and learning and learning and um, started driving down there in the mornings before work and starting to hunt and just like any opportunity I could get to hunt, I would and, and making time to hunt and i just figured there had to be a better way and i kept driving home and i'd see these deer all over you know feeding in the the yards in front of these houses and um you know eventually got some permission to hunt some some private properties from some of my uh my grandma's friends and other people's uh you know people that i knew through one or two degrees of separation and eventually you know I started shooting a lot of deer and then they were happy because they weren't seeing as many deer and then they would tell their friends and their friends would call me and it kind of spread like wildfire and word of mouth of, uh, you know, that this guy will come and, and hunt the deer and get them out of your garden for you. And, um, it was a target rich environment and I absolutely loved it. And the, the, the gas was on the flame at that point and, um, it just took off. So how long ago was that? It kind of really started yeah, that was, getting crazy on you. 
that was like 2008, 2009 is when I really started having like, you know, 50, 75 deer a year type, type years. Okay. And, um, you know, and then I started getting a bunch more properties and, you know, to the point where I was hunting, you know, in that 150 day a year range and, and shooting, you know, probably getting successful on, you know, 50% of my hunts, 60% of my hunts. So I, I'm really kind of um, really picky on efficiency. I, I think that if I'm going to take the time to do it, I want it to be done as best as possible. Um, and so, yeah, ever since like 2010, 2011, I, I really kind of had the formula figured out at that point. And, and I never really think that you can ever get to a point where you have it figured out. I try to always learn from every time I climb a tree you know, how to pick the right spot, how to figure out when the deer are going to be there, constantly checking between, you know, wind, weather, cover, of the cloud cover and, and temperature and barometric pressure and trying to figure out kind of a, a pattern that makes deer move or that something that can make me more successful. Um, and I mean, I don't expect to kill a deer every time I go out in the woods. I don't want to harvest a deer every time I go out in the woods. Uh, and frankly, I get tired of dragging them. But also, I think it would get kind of um, tiring or, or it would lose its luster, really, if you just were going out and shooting deer every time you went. It, it would be killing at that point instead of hunting. And I really like the, the chess match of, of hunting deer. Um, that's kind of what really draws me to it. And, I mean, I know a lot of guys love to shoot big bucks. But, man, for me, when I kill an old doe that's in a family group, that I've hunted for a while, those deer are smart. They know when they come through. I mean, by the time you shoot two deer from the same tree, I, I won't hunt that tree anymore because they know that something's going on there. Um, and that's kind of what led me to, to the system that I have of hunting is because putting a ladder stand or a lock on on a tree just doesn't work for me. You know, I have uh, probably close to a thousand trees, maybe more, prepped to climb within a 15 minute drive of my house. And, um, there's no way I could possibly even have sticks or bolts or any type of climbing system set up in a third of those trees. I, I, my wife would have kicked me out a long time ago if I had that many <laughs> stands and gear. Uh, so I kind of had to, to figure out a system and, and adapt and evolve, uh, with it. So how long have you been, uh, did you switch to the saddle? Uh, so I, I do hunt out of a tree saddle. I started hunting out of a saddle in 2009. Um, I, I, one of the books that I read, I mean, you know, I'm not joking when I said I read every single book pretty much published. And, uh, I mean, I'd have to shoot you a picture of my bookshelf. Uh, but I, I started reading John Eberhardt's books and, um, I, I remember reading the chapter in his bow hunting pressured whitetails about, um, about saddles and I put the book down and I looked it up I googled it and I had no idea that the trophy line company had already gone out of business this was like right about the time they did and I found one on eBay that was I don't know it was like 125 bucks or something and at the time whatever price it was was a lot of money to me and I bought that instead of having you know, grocery money for the rest of the month. Uh, it was like halfway through the month and I bought that saddle and ate ramen for two weeks. Oh, and, uh, it, and it was the best investment I ever made because it opened my eyes to a whole nother world of hunting. And, uh, and it was, it's just awesome. And so it, it really took off from there. And, you know, I've had a handful of other saddles. Um, now I'm hunting with the, the Mantis, uh, from, from tethered and, um, you know, really with a great group of guys over at Tethered, we helped, uh, you know, play around with the prototypes and, and talk with Greg and Ernie and make the, you know, the best saddle we could. And that thing is awesome. Uh, I've probably killed, geez, I think I've killed 10 or 12 deer from it now, uh, um, just this summer. And, and it's just, it is awesome. That and the platform, the platform for me was really the game changer. And we can get into that, you know, later down the road if we want to talk more saddles, but, uh, for me, I could never really find a system I was truly comfortable with for my feet. You know, I, I'm a big guy. I'm 6'3". 
245 pounds, 250 pounds. And the, the, the screw in steps just did not work. No matter what boots I had, I was having trouble, um, finding something that didn't put that much pressure on my feet. I didn't like screwing them into the tree every time I climbed up. So I was using some, some strap on steps and those were okay. Um, the wild edge steps were really awesome, but I, I still didn't like having to set three or four of them up around the tree. And I think that's more of a personal preference thing. But when I started using a platform, it was like, I felt like I was home, you know, it really clicked and, and was a great system and I can spin around on it, you know, shoot all around the tree. And, and that's just a, a deadly combination, literally. See, I think you're you're making everybody else out there jealous because you've already <laughs> shot like ten animals out of yours, and the rest of them are just waiting for it to show up. <laughs> I know they're they're coming. I promise. I uh, they're they're. I know the guys over at Tethered are excited to get them out the door and, and get guys in them because it is oh. truly just a a phenomenal system. I think people will be really impressed when they get them. Yeah, and, and uh, anybody who's listened to the show has has heard uh, a handful of conversations that I've had with with guys about um, about hunting from a saddle that I'd, I'd researched it for a number of years and had a Kestrel in my cart about six or seven times and just never pulled the trigger. But then I, uh, I finally got turned on to the uh, to tethered and the Mantis and, and finally pulled the trigger. And, um, you know, I'm just waiting for it to arrive and, and hopefully soon. I know those guys are doing everything they can to, uh, to get them out to people. And I, I really commend the, the job they've done over there because it's been fantastic. Yeah, you'll, you'll really enjoy a saddle when you get it. There's kind of a little bit of a learning curve to it. I mean, cause I had hunted out of climbers and, and lock ons and, uh, I hated, I, so early on in my kind of hunting career, I got really into reading topography in, in bigger woods areas, trying to figure out areas based on topo where I might have the highest odds of finding a deer. And then I got into the bedding. And so, I'd, I'd pick these spots out when I was hunting that military base that were like miles back in the woods. And I'd schlep back there with my climber and then I'd get to the spot that I marked on my GPS and then I'd have to look all around for a tree. And by the time I found, you know, the one tree that I could climb with my climber, I was 40 or 50 or 60 yards from, from the, the topographic feature that I wanted. And I'd see deer come through there and I'd, I'd you know, kick myself cause I couldn't, I was hunting for a tree instead of hunting the spot that I wanted. And, um, you know, shortly after that, when I got the, the saddle and, and kind of got past that little learning curve of, you know, what it's like to have your weight kind of in your butt and, and in your feet the entire time and being suspended from the tree, it feels a little strange at first. Um, but once you get used to it, there's no turning back. I mean, I don't, I do not think I could hunt from a regular tree stand tomorrow if you, if you told me I had to. I want to think about um, – the only thing that's rolling through my mind here is uh, – so about 10 years ago, roughly, um, you started getting uh, more successful, getting more permissions. Uh, you started hunting from a saddle. It seems like a lot of things changed in a, a short amount of time around a decade ago or so. Do you, do you think – that you got more successful um, because you were hunting from a saddle or because you were reading these books and learning these, these new tactics, or do you think maybe it was more uh, you got more permissions or did, did one kind of lead to the other or, or was it kind of just all at once? You know, that's a good question. I mean, I think it was really a combination of, of everything because it was, it was having the confidence to try and implement the, the strategies that I kept seeing pop up in each and every book that were kind of underlying themes in the big woods environment um, out on that military base that was pretty heavily pressured that started leading to having success and, and a, a lot of success at finding deer. And then once I had that confidence, um, you know, I started hunting the suburbs and I was able to take that kind of what I'd learned in the woods to the suburbs and pick 
you know, the properties to hunt based on wind and, and find those natural pinch points and funnels. I mean, if you look at, a, at an aerial view of a, of a suburban area and you start looking at, at how the trees connect with, with the creek systems and then all, everything else is open, you know, yard, the deer want to be in that cover right on that edge. That's no different than kind of hunting the inside corner of a, of a giant ag field. It's just, I have 50 different property owners I have to deal with as opposed to the guy who only has one. But, um, you know, once you see how deer like to move, they're going to stay the same regardless of whether they're in the suburbs or in the woods. So I think that, you know, having that confidence moving from the big woods into the urban area and then having success right away in the suburbs. I mean, granted the, the deer that I'm hunting, I have, a very high likelihood of seeing and harvesting deer because my population density is so high. I mean, if you talk to my, you know, my buddies up in Minnesota um, and, and, you know, my buddy Taylor up there, he's got like 15 deer on, on his back 40, you know, he knows them all. He knows where they're coming from. You know, his deer density is probably, you know, 20 deer per square mile, 25 deer per square mile. I mean, we have pockets here, in, in Northern Virginia where they can't even put a number, an accurate number on the deer density, but they think it's around 350 to 400 deer per square mile. Wow. And so, I mean, you know, am I a great hunter? No, I, I, you know, I know what I need to do in order to harvest animals, but, um, you know, I also have a high, high population, uh, to, to kind of be, putting a dent in if that makes sense and i don't want that to get misconstrued as the hunting here is easy because it's not i mean if if you're in in your typical khakis and loafers you can walk almost right up to a deer because they know that you know they've seen those people before but the second that you you know put your camo on and you climb a tree and and they know that you're a predator i mean and and the second that they get hunted they know i mean they they are smart and they know how to avoid certain areas and um, and it's really kind of a fun cat and mouse game of hunting that we all love. It's just a little different as far as, you know, what I'm surrounded by multi-million dollar houses instead of a beautiful chunk of hardwoods. Uh, I want to talk a sec about, um, you had touched on something for a minute with this, you know, it's, it's basically management that you're doing with your hunting. Um, you're in a unique position to, to see the effects that deer can have in the, you know, with the deer densities that you have, the effects that they can have on the landscape. Can you talk a little bit about um, the reasons why you, you have to manage a herd like this, that you just can't leave nature to do nature's thing and uh, kind of some of the, the, the negative effects that all of these high deer density areas are having with, with the, you know, the impact that the deer are having on, on the area? Yeah. So, I mean, our, our ecosystem here is in big trouble. Um, if you talk to any of the urban foresters, for example, in the various counties that I hunt, you know, they put ages on the forest and, and our forest and pockets where the forest, you know, basically our, our suburban area, we don't have tons of mature trees outside of the park areas because it's mostly suburbs. Uh, and there are some, so, you know, there's good timber and such in the areas that weren't constructed on, but we don't have big chunks of it. Uh, but all of the, the ages of our trees are incredibly old. And the problem that we have is that the deer numbers and population, they're so high that the deer have eaten all of the browse completely down. It, it's gone. And so if you're you know, if one of those big trees falls over in a windstorm or a snowstorm, there isn't a young, supple one to take its place. And so the, the urban foresters are really concerned about, you know, the health of our of our forest because, you know, when those big trees fall down, there isn't something to shoot back up and take its place. And, and you know, what we have in the in the understory, it's completely just dis- it's just non-existent up to about seven feet tall, um, as high as a deer can reach. And so if you go into the, you know, George Washington national forest or any of the parks around here, 
uh, and you you just crouch down to about four feet tall, you can see as far as the topography will let you because the deer have eaten everything out of there. Uh, I, I've had deer in the wintertime come up to a tree and eat the bark off of a tree because there was nothing else to eat, and they're just trying to put something in their stomach. So they're, they're literally starving. Um, on top of that, we have a horrible, horrible tick problem here where, I mean, anyone that you talk to, they either directly have had Lyme's disease or know somebody once removed from them that has had Lyme's disease. Um, and we have tons and tons of vehicle car collisions uh, annually. I think that we're the number one, if not number one, we're in the top three of areas for the insurance companies that have, um, you know, collisions with deer uh, per capita here. So, I mean, the, the deer are just rampantly overpopulated. They're destroying the ecosystem. They don't have any browse. And, you know, when, when we go in and, and have a developer buy an old farm and, and tear it down to build a house there, well, that farm had a certain yield to it that, that could support wildlife, and it was relatively low. The problem is that when we go in and we put in all these, you know, fertilized pretty plants, well, that's just nothing but a giant food plot for deer. Um, and the deer love it. And they're able to, to get more protein out of that than they could out of the normal browse that would have been there in the forest. And so it sustains a higher population of the deer um, without intentionally doing that but it's only part of the year that they're able to sustain that. So when all those plants go dormant and stuff, the deer don't have their natural browse, and then they're just wandering around getting smoked by cars or, you know, eating bark and just being overpopulated. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing to me, um, the amount of destruction that they can do. And, and you and I were talking a little bit before, before we started recording that I live and grew up in a city that, uh, has similar problems. I don't think quite as bad as what you've got down there, but are still seeing some real ramifications from, from such a high deer density. And yeah, people still either don't understand what you're trying to do through, uh, the management that you're using and, or they're, they're just kind of, um, you know, mean towards it, I guess, because they just don't understand it or they don't believe in it. Or I think it's just kind of a, a miseducation that they don't understand what you're doing it for. But how do you, how do you, I mean, you're in DC. Uh, you know, I, I have to deal with some of these people in the city here. And um, I mean, some of them, I just, I just can't handle some of them because they're, they're so <laughs> far removed from uh, where their food comes from that Oh, come, just, come hang out, come hang out with me for a weekend, man. <laughs> uh, how do you deal with that? I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, some of the people that you have permissions from, or at least some of the people that you're interacting with have to either not know or not understand what you're trying to do, or they just don't agree with it at all. How do you, how do you live with that? <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, I run across all different walks of life. A lot of the people that I interact with are highly educated. Most of them work for the government in some form, whether that be directly for the government or indirectly as a private contractor. But, you know, everybody is pretty educated in their own field, but a lot of people don't care to look at the deer population, the deer numbers, what they should be, what they are. They just don't care. They, they, they're like, Oh, the deer are back. Um, some people, I mean, the people that contact me, they all know, I mean, some of them know the, the troubles and the issues. Some of them just know that they see too many deer and they want them gone. Some of them are tired because the deer have eaten all their landscaping or they can't plant anything in a garden. Um, but anytime I go into a new property, I have, I, I always ask them to talk to their neighbors because there's no better person to, to speak on your behalf to the neighbors than the client that you're talking to. And uh, I'll always ask them like, okay, who was receptive and, and who wasn't? Cause I know for the, whatever neighbor they tell me was the least receptive. That's where the first deer is running that I shoot with a bow. So um, 
you know, and you try to go talk to these people and just say, Hey, look, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm helping your neighbor reduce the deer herd. Uh, the food goes, you know, one of the positives we have here in Virginia is that we have a hunters for the hungry program, which is where I'm able to donate the deer that I harvest, uh, at no cost to me to a local butcher and they will process the meat for free and they donate the meat to the local homeless shelters and food banks. So that program itself has gotten me pretty good leeways with, with some of the anti hunters. I mean, people that are on the fence about it, at least they feel good at the fact that, okay, this guy isn't just out for, for his bloodthirst to kill. Um, you know, that he, he's doing something good with the meat, but, I, I run across a lot of people that just they're either misinformed or they have their own opinions on the deer or they think the deer are pretty. A lot of people will feed them, which is illegal here in Virginia. Um, and I try to tell them that. And I mean, anyone who wants to have an educated or a calm conversation, I'm more than happy to, to discuss with and listen to their points. Unfortunately, most of the people that I interact with are are adamantly opposed to what I'm doing. And I mean, some of the stuff that I've heard or had happen is just insane. Um, and, and a lot of those people do not care to listen. They've already made their mind up. And, and those are the people that are hardest, the hardest to deal with because there's no reasoning with them. I mean, you could tell them that the sky's blue and if they don't believe it, they're just not going to believe you. And I mean, they they've made up their mind. Yeah, I feel like I have a whole city of those people living. <laughs> I, <laughs> living I have close neighborhoods, <laughs> neighborhoods full of them. I had a, a lady that wouldn't let me retrieve a deer that had run and expired on her front lawn. And I went up and knocked on the door. And uh, I said, you know, ma'am, my name's Taylor. I introduced myself. I said, I harvested this deer. And the deer was literally 30 feet from me. But I had to get permission because it's on her property. And uh, she stuck her head out and saw the deer laying there and started screaming at me. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, she put her hands on her hips and goes, you did what? <laughs> I said, I harvested this deer, and I, I, I'd like your permission to remove it from your property. And she just goes, no, you've done enough damage tonight. You, you, know, you get out of here. I said, well, ma'am, I mean, I'm not in agreement that I've done any damage, but it's done. The deer is here. Let me take it and let it feed a family that needs it. And she refused to let me get it. And then, you know, I, so I called the game warden who I know. And then the next day he called, he went over and talked to her and I eventually got to go get the deer. But by then the coyotes had destroyed it. And, you know, I really badly wanted to tell her, look at what you've done because you caused this to go to waste as opposed to feed a family that needed it. You know, I mean, I understand if you're if you're against something, that's fine. I'm happy to talk to you about it. But, you know, don't let something go to waste. That, that's the worst thing as far as I'm concerned, because and, and we do have a really bad coyote population here. Um, and more and more homeowners are starting to see that. And they also want the coyotes reduced. But, I mean, if we don't deal with a population boom as humans, Mother Nature is going to deal with it, and that's why we're starting to see items like chronic wasting disease and, um, you know, the coyote population really ramping up. We don't have any black bears in our part of the state here, but um, I'm sure they're not too far away once they realize how bad the deer are here. I want to touch on real quick, um, because you brought up a good point, uh, for, for an area with such high deer density, what is your... Um, what do your regulations for like CWD look like? And, and do you got, is it a big problem down there because of there's so uh, many deer numbers or. So we're fortunate that the counties that I hunt in, uh, we have not had any reported cases of chronic wasting disease. Hmm. Uh, about an hour West of me, right on the Virginia, West Virginia border, really more like an hour and a half West of me. Uh, they have had, I believe it is two, maybe it's three reported cases of chronic wasting disease. So it has been reported in the state that county is on lockdown. Uh, you know, no deer can, can leave that 
county that are harvested and they have a, a bunch of other regulations. I'm not too familiar with the exact regulations just because I don't hunt in that specific county, but um, you know, it, it is spreading and it's, it's getting worse. Um, and we do not allow bait in the state of Virginia. We also don't allow uh, natural deer lures to be used. The, okay. the department of game um, decided that that was a, a potential way to transmit CWD. So uh, we're only allowed to use synthetic ones. Um, do you but that's any, really any synthetic uh, deer attractants or anything like that or lures? I do not. I've never had any good luck with them, but I'm also, I'm not, I'm not buck hunting. So, I mean, if, if I, um, it, it might be different if I was back in the middle of the woods looking for a, for a bruiser. And I mean, we, I do see and, and shoot, you know, good bucks. Um, it's just, I'm not setting up to only shoot a buck. I mean, I kind of feel like, you know, my, my kind of mission or what I'm, my goal is to reduce the deer herd as much as, as possible. And, uh, anytime I have an ethical shot on a, on a whitetail that I'm able to take, I, I take it. Um, and the only time that I kind of limit myself is I've, I've found that I have to stop shooting deer at four, uh, per, per sit because after four deer, the blood trails really, really start getting kind of crossed up and you start walking circles. It makes them, uh, even when you watch them crash, I love walking blood trails just to try and keep teaching myself and, and learning from them. Uh, but you'll walk yourself in circles after four. So I, I stopped shooting at four, but other than that, if I have an ethical shot on one, I'm, I'm taking it. What's, what's the most number of deer you've ever shot in one set? Uh, well, four, four. I mean, okay. I, I, yeah. Um, although sometimes, uh, pregnant fawns, I guess, or pregnant does. I mean, yeah, it, it's a really, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. You, know, you feel bad about it, but at the same time, from a, from an ethical standpoint of trying to reduce the herd, you know, it, it's three deer with one arrow as opposed to, to just one. So, yeah. you know, yeah, because you, um, you know, the difference is everybody else listening may not kind of understand kind of the context that you're speaking in and that you guys don't really have a season, right? It's kind of just ongoing. Uh, so it's kind of broken up. So what we have is, is we have our deer season. So we have uh, the first weekend in September through the end of, I think they changed it to April this year. Okay. Uh, is, is antlerless deer season and depending on the county that you're in. So in my counties, uh, that that's our season from uh, the first week in October through the first weekend in January, you can shoot either bucks or does. Um, so what we get here is we get our standard three buck, well, three either sex tags and then three antlerless tags with our, with our hunting license. And then you can re-up uh, for antlerless tags. You get six at a time for $18. Um, so I go through quite a, quite yeah. a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, we're able to just, just keep loading up as many times as you want on the, on the antlerless does uh, or on the antlerless deer. <clears throat> and then um, when the season ends, quote unquote, in April, the homeowners are able to apply for, um, you know, damage permits. Okay. And then, so we get to hunt, the permit gets issued. And then once the state comes out and verifies the damage, and then we continue hunting all the way up until that first weekend in September. So yeah, there, there's no off time. Uh, you can't hunt public lands year round. You can hunt them, uh, Monday through Saturday and, in, within the season, but uh, there's still some public lands up here or here that have those seasons on them. Okay. So it's really, it's kind of funny, you know, when, when I graduated from college, I moved back to this area because my family's business was here. That's what I was going to work in. And I was really bummed. I was like, man, I'd love to like 
moved to the Midwest on some farm and just get to hunt all the time. And, and really I didn't know it then, but I was moving back to the sportsman's paradise of, yeah. of, of the East coast because I mean, you know, we have some phenomenal hunting here. I mean, if you want to shoot deer, I mean, look, you're not going to shoot a 160 like you would in Missouri, but you can shoot a solid like high 130s, low 140s buck uh, if you put in some time. And we have great, you know, waterfowl hunting. You can you can fish until your heart's content over in the mountains. I mean, there's plenty of, of opportunities for a sportsman here. You just kind of have to know where to look and, and put in the effort, and eventually you'll find it. Well, I think you've um, you know you've done probably the best segue better than I could have done. So we, we've talked about the whys you do all this. I want to get kind of into the brass tacks and talk about the hows you're getting some of this done. So you, you get a whole bunch of sits. Um, you know, you get 200 plus opportunities a year and you're successful more than 50% of the time generally. Uh, yeah. 35% thir- of the time is okay. kind of the, the hard number, but um, it, it gets where it gets tricky there on the percentage wise is multiples. So you could hunt, yep. you know, all week and just have one hunt where you shoot four deer, or then you have two or three hunts back to back where you shoot two or three. But yeah, it, it's a, you know, 35 to, to 40% ratio, which is, I'm not complaining about. I, I'm see, I, I would take those odds all day long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the tactics that you use for this and kind of, um, I know you you said you've kind of developed a system for it, but I want to I want to talk a little bit about how you're hunting these areas. So you said that um, you know obviously there's it's it's urban, so there's a lot of houses, and you're hunting these these vegetated water areas, these undeveloped sections, kind of in the in between all of these. Um, where are you setting up? On, I'm assuming you're, you know, you're maybe finding trails or something that come through, or maybe they're just skinny enough that the deer meander through. But are you like down deep in the center of these, uh, these waterways, or are you kind of up on the sides looking in, or how do you set up as the deer are coming through? Uh, so what I do is, is it's dependent on the properties um, that I have access on, and what that kind of underlying area looks like so if i can get in to a spot where it's obvious that the deer are bedding close by um let's take one spot that i have off the top of my head kind of for an example this is a it's a floodplain area so there's a creek that kind of skirts a corner of it and um it's all just kind of overgrown floodplain which is great browse for for whitetail um with no oak trees. So if there's a specific food source on the property and I'm hunting in the evenings, I'll hunt over the food source as long as the deer are using it. Um, as the food source dries up, let's say there's a white oak tree that's dropping and it's September. I'm going to hunt that white oak tree because the deer are just going to come there all evening long and, and they'll shoot four deer almost every time as long as they're in the area. Um, as the season gets a little longer, I'll, I'll slowly work my way back towards that bedding area. Uh, and I'll know I'll only hunt that spot when the wind is right or when the homeowners are, are seeing deer. What's kind of weird about the deer here in the suburbs are there's so many factors that bump deer and push deer that the deer never seem to be bedding in the same spot. So it's not like on a farm where there's bedding area feeding area hunt somewhere between point a and point b and you'll see deer because you don't know what what that deer encountered maybe there were you know the neighbor was walking the dog with his dog off the leash and it ran the deer away or maybe the deer are over in the smith's yard eating their azaleas i mean the deer tend to kind of work on this it's almost like a nomadic pattern Hmm. where they kind of rotate through on a week or bi-weekly basis so I'm, I'm in contact with all of the homeowners who properties I hunt on constantly, texting them, emailing them. I've found that they are the best source of accurate information 
uh, to killing deer. I also talk to the mailmen a lot and UPS guys, um, people that are, that are in the service industry that are constantly running around the neighborhood. And some of the, some of the bigger deer I've shot, buck wise came from a mailman who was like man i see this monster buck in this guy's yard <laughs> every afternoon and i'm like which yard okay and um you know went, went in there got permission and, and shot him but um the the homeowners know when the deer are there and, and if you listen to them you'll be really successful and you won't waste your time you know stinking up a property with your scent and and your intrusion because you know, the urban deer are really good at picking up people's patterns. And as long as people stick to their patterns, you're fine. But the second that they realize somebody is breaking that pattern or doing something out of the ordinary, that's when they start getting really, really kind of sketchy. Hmm. And and they'll start changing their pattern as well because they know that they're prey and they know that they're, you know, they're fine in their own little bubble as long as you're, you know, you're not, breaking out so um back to that example i mean on the floodplain property there's no oak tree there there's a nice creek crossing coming right out of the bedding area and when the wind is right and the homeowner has seen deer a day or two days i will go hunt that that little creek crossing i'll hunt about 18 yards from the creek crossing and i'll shoot the first two does that come across the creek and then i'll let it rest for two weeks, three weeks, and the cycle will kind of repeat itself. Um, So I I try to find natural funnel points or pinch points uh, close to bedding or close to a destination food source that I know that the deer are going to get to. Do you, uh, so you're you're saying that these deer are generally kind of nomadic and they're they're bedding in all different areas. Do you see... um, like a, a tendency of areas that they seem to bed in more often than others, like a, a, a feature or a, a size of an area that they're in, or do you see any consistency across that, or is it just kind of wherever? Yeah, that they they really like to be on the, I mean, the areas that you or I would want to be in if we were being hunted and we needed to use every defense mechanism that we had and i know that sounds kind of corny but i mean where we are they love to be on those little you know leeward side points or or the area where they can use the topography to their advantage and where people don't go so a lot of the floodplains around here have tons of you know briars and and really kind of nasty overgrown stuff the deer love that they can walk through that no problem a human's never going back there and and they'll just stand there the entire time because they can feed on it and bed right under it and use the wind to their advantage. The second that wind changes, they're going to move on and they're going to slowly kind of work around their, whatever their little circuit is that they have. And, and they won't be back to that area for, you know, a couple of days or a week or so. It's really kind of, kind of strange. It's almost like they have all these like satellite, bedding locations within the neighborhood and i think that it's because they're only you know half a dozen spots or 10 spots that are that fit the criteria that they want to naturally bed in and they're just farther apart than they normally would be on a farm for example uh so it requires them to walk a little further and and get into them one of the best spots that i have is is where uh, we were talking about looking on an aerial map where it kind of comes in like an hourglass and pinches in between these two gigantic neighborhoods. And it's just a little 40 yard wide floodplain uh, or maybe 50 yard wide floodplain. And I can just sit right in the middle of it and have a shot at deer that come through from anywhere. And quite often, especially in the mornings, that's a great spot because the deer are just traversing through there, kind of working back to their other, their next location, if you will. Um, and it seems to always hold deer, and it's a great spot to access because they're never bedding in there. So as long as you get in before they start trying to move through, um, you're good to go. But a lot of the places I hunt will have trails that the, that humans kind of walk on through. And so if you look at the trails and, and figure out the most remote location within that cover type uh, for the deer to get to where humans rarely go, there will almost 
always be deer there. Do you, um, do you find yourself more successful hunting in the morning or evening? So my, that's kind of a loaded question. I, I, <laughs> Uh, up until recently, I haven't gotten to hunt many evenings because I just built my work schedule around hunting in the morning. Okay. Uh, so, so maybe ninety percent of my hunts were were in the morning, and um, my wife is also a real early morning person. So she she does a lot of long distance running. So we would both get up at you know four thirty. She would start her fifteen or twenty mile run, and I would go to a tree stand. Um, we recently had a baby girl in uh, the middle of June, actually born on Father's Day morning. So I'm thinking that mornings are no longer going to work. So I'm kind of revamping my schedule uh, to hunt in the afternoons. And I'm actually really excited about it because the, you know, the evening is the deer's morning. And from all of my experience, I've found the afternoon to be better hunting than the morning uh, for the most part, with the exception of, of, um, some of the mornings right after a full moon, I found the first week after a full moon to be really good in the mornings. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty stoked to be able to hunt the afternoons now at will and just kind of build my, my schedule in to let my wife run in the morning and take baby duty. And then, uh, the evenings are mine. So it should be good. There you go. Well, so I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you <laughs> yeah. next year with yeah. an answer on that one. Yeah. You have to give me an update on how yeah. that works out for you. Yeah, we'll see. Um, Let's talk a little bit about um, your equipment. And I think I'll, maybe we'll start this on kind of a, a 30,000 foot view of what you're using and then maybe kind of hone in on some pieces. Because I think you've got uh, a unique situation where for so, you know, over so many years and, and so many hunts, you really have uh, almost better than anybody I can recollect um, the time kind of put into that that you've uh, been able to use kind of different broadheads or different arrows or uh, just different techniques or whatever have you you know kind of using that saddle hunting as a as an example you've you found kind of honing your craft that saddle hunting was a a great tactic for you because it was just more conducive to uh, the the areas that you're hunting Um, so I guess I want to kind of touch on the different pieces of equipment that you're using and then maybe we'll just kind of expand from there yeah sounds good so uh i'm a saddle hunter i hunt 100 percent out of a saddle um i bow hunt 100 percent. obviously I'm in, I'm in the suburbs so i don't have the opportunity to uh use a rifle um and i prefer the bow hunting uh anyways so I am am very picky about my bow's performance. Um, I tune all my own equipment. I tune a lot of my buddy's equipment. And uh, they they can tell you that I'm a true perfectionist when it comes to that. So um, between arrow weight, I'm always playing with front of center and getting trying to get the optimal arrow. I've found um, I prefer a single pin sight just because of the fact that I don't shoot over 20 yards. I, I cannot take the risk of taking a shot that I don't have a 100% chance of, of shooting the lungs out on because the difference between a deer running 30 yards and piling up and a deer running 300 yards and bedding down and, and eventually dying is a huge difference. And uh, where I am, 300 yards could be six different doors I have to knock on that now all those people are aware to the fact that I'm hunting in the neighborhood and, you know, could have issues with it, could give me a headache. They could come mess with my, you know, the property owners, who knows? So, um, I, I've been shooting the Hoyt bow for years. I love my Hoyt. Uh, I I've been shooting the spot hog. I actually got the double pin sight this year just cause I thought it was, kind of cool uh concept and so with my top pin dead on at 20 yards the bottom one's at like 35 yards 36 yards which is i'm never going to use the bottom pin but uh, (laughs) cool to have nonetheless um i'm shooting a a 30 and a half inch draw i have a 30 inch black eagle carnivore uh arrow that i'm shooting and it's got 90 grains of brass in the front so it's a 550 grain arrow 
Um, again, I want to make sure that I have enough, you know, kinetic energy to, to blow through anything that I hit to, to prevent the possibility of a, uh, a longer tracking job. And in that same vein, I've been shooting rage broadheads for years. Um, the hypodermic for me is just phenomenal. Um, I, I love the huge hole. Again, that's entirely built around the, the idea of m- rapid blood loss, biggest hole possible, make them drop as soon as they can. And uh, I go through a ton of broadheads and rage uh, have really, the hypodermic has really stood up to a lot of abuse to where I can just, you know, pop the blades out, sharpen them on a wet stud and, and pop them back in. And, um, and they're good to go. I have one broadhead last year that went through over 30 deer, uh, and were, it was totally fine. So until eventually it hit a rock after it did a pass through and broke the tip in half, which was kind of a bummer because I was trying to see how many deer I could go, but I think 31 is pretty good. Uh, that's, that's uh, pretty good odds there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, that's kind of my bow setup. I shoot a, a thumb trigger release, um, how many pounds uh, is your Hoyt? So I shoot a, it's a 65 pound okay. bow. It's a 55, 65 and it, it's topped out at like 68.2 pounds, uh, I believe. So uh, last year I screwed up my shoulder in the gym. Uh, for any of you guys out there that like to lift weights as well, make sure your form is impeccable and do not try to show off with your little brother who's a bodybuilder while you're at the gym <laughs> because you will screw up your rotator cuff. Um, So I ended up not being able to draw a bow around the beginning of December. I'd really screwed my shoulder up. Uh, So I hunted with a crossbow for, for about three months. And the crossbow is a a phenomenal tool in the suburbs. I prefer to bow hunt. I really like to to shoot a bow. I I think it's kind of an art form. It's a kind of an intimate thing. Um, But the crossbow was a really deadly combination that time of year when there was no foliage on the trees. Um, I'm completely mobile with my setup. So I have a, uh, a pretty small Badlands. I think it's the monster fanny pack. Um, inside that pack, I have wet wipes. If you guys listen to some of the other stories that I've uh, shared on various <laughs> <Yeah>. podcasts, <laughs> I think you'll know why, why I always have a big pack of wet wipes in a uh, readily accessible area. I keep, um, you know, just the basic kind of face mask gloves. I keep an extra release in there, uh, just in case I drop my other one or what, whatnot. Uh, I keep a field dressing kit kind of in the front right pack of, um, uh, latex gloves, keep a couple different, um, Gerber disposable blade knives. I found those work the best. Um, and, uh, then just various, uh, for my, for my saddle, I have a back band, uh, that I keep inside that pack. And then, uh, that's really it. So the pack is, is super light. I, I like to video my hunts, so I'll keep my camera in there and then I'll just strap my camera arm on the outside of it. Um, and then I use the wild edge, uh, steps to, to okay. ascend the tree. Uh, I've found that those are the absolute best system possible so some of the floodplains that i hunt um you know the fact that it's kind of open land in between a bunch of houses is naturally where you know the high school kids want to gravitate to on friday night to drink beer and and do high school you know kids stuff so um i just i stopped leaving my sticks my climbing sticks in the trees a long time ago because they're just ripe to get screwed with. And um, I really try to be out of sight, out of mind for the entire process of, of hunting, a tr- hunting a spot. So I use uh, either four or five wild edge steps with five wild edge steps. I can be at 25 feet uh, for my feet uh, to be. So I'll, I'll use kind of a climbing aider. Okay. Um, yeah to climb up and step between those steps. And, um, it's actually the, the easiest method I've found until recently was using my, my main rope with a, 
with the ascender and just putting a, an aider in and cranking up and then just stepping up. And I mean, trust me, I am not that flexible of a guy. And, and for me to get um, five and a half feet per step is, is pretty awesome. Um, so I use those wild edge steps and then I use the, the platform from tethered the, um, the predator. And before that I had a homemade platform from one of, uh, you know, like a kit that you can, piece together but it's really my, my system is pretty simple I, I try to keep it simple uh i i keep everything in the same pocket in the exact same spot clipped into the same loop on my saddle you know i i just i find that the re- the repetition of the system is really the key to being as efficient as possible and and being able to get up a tree uh as quickly as possible so I use the, the Onyx Maps uh, app on my phone. So I have a certain logo for a tree that I have prepped. I have a certain logo for an area in the scout. And I have a certain logo for uh, a tree that does have my sticks in it. So I, I probably only have about like 30, 25 or 30 sets of sticks out now. I used to have closer to like 55, 60. Wow. Um, and I've just kind of scaled it back over the years. This thing's rust. The straps are potentially dangerous and there's really no reason to leave them up now with that wild edge system. It just works better. Uh, and, and it's less obvious that I've been there. So I, I prefer that, um, to the sticks. And also, you know, people can't, can't figure out your hunting there. They can't kind of poach your spots or, or whatever. So, um, I really found that to be the ultimate system with the climbing aider. Something else that I do is I never wear my camo from my house to the property. And that's not for a scent control reason. Um, that that's solely for a out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. So I have a, uh, I, ha- I drive a pickup truck. My truck doesn't have any hunting stickers on it. Um, it, you know, it just looks like every other construction guys truck around here uh i have a tub with all my hunting stuff in it uh, as far as my you know camouflage my saddle my backpack everything or my fanny pack uh and my steps all kind of layered in there in the in the order that i put them on so i'll get to the spot i'll layer up my my camo uh i'm a big first light guy i love first lights system it, for me, it's imperative to have that system because I'm hunting anywhere from 115 degree days in August or 105 degrees with, you know, 10,000 percent humidity all the way down to days in January, February, where it's, you know, feels like negative 15 and the wind's howling. So being able to layer up and or or, you know, wear high quality gear that will breathe well is a is a big deal to me. But um you know, I'll constantly keep my tub rotating through the pieces that I'll need to be wearing, and I'll wear some some underlayers, but I'll have them covered up uh, in the winter to where it's it's not you can't see any camouflage on my body um, until I get to the spot. I'll park and then put my camouflage on and just slip into the woods uh, as discreetly as possible. What's your average walk, uh, like distance wise, from where you're <laughs> truck to your stand? Yeah, I mean, most of them are, I mean, some are as short as like 30 yards. I actually, uh, I thought I shot my truck one night. <laughs> I, uh, Man. I had on on a property, I had some deer come up out of a creek bottom and it was flat. And, you know, I'm like 25 feet up. This deer comes trotting out and I shot her and the, the lighted knock when it went through her skipped up and and I thought the arrow had flown into my truck. Um, and I just started freaking out, started using my binoculars, looking at my truck, trying to see if I'd shot it. Um, and thankfully, what happened was when the arrow passed through, it smashed a rock that was down in the mud. And, and the, the arrow blew up. And somehow that knock came out of there kind of spinning and just went towards my truck. But... Thank God it didn't hit it. Um, but yeah, I mean, so that walk is, you know, maybe 40 yards, um, 
some are, are longer. I mean, some are like up to a half a mile. There's a property that I hunt that's uh, right around 90 acres. And I mean, there's some pretty steep, you know, spots in there, but for the most part, it's probably in that like 75 to 150 yard kind of mark. Okay. So not, well, not far, not well, far at all, but, yeah, but not as, I mean, you know, it, it's all property dependent. Some of the properties I can see my truck from, uh, a lot of my trees I can see the truck from a lot of my trees. I can smell what the homeowner is cooking for breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, like, how far, um, you know, I know you're, like, in between properties and, like, um, you know, in these waterways, so you're you're still, like, pretty close to people's backyards and stuff, too, I mean. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, it's amazing what you can see from uh, from a tree in the suburbs. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It, kids playing and just... Uh, you know, it, it's just kind of amazing what those deer probably see on, on day in and out. But, um, and one thing I forgot to mention when we were talking about gear, I, I'm a huge fan of binoculars. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have a, a pair of Vortex, uh, razors that I love. And, um, I use one of those Alaska guide creation bino bevies or whatever they're called, the, the binocular harness. Mm-hmm. Um, that thing is a godsend. I mean, I, I could, I could actually hunt just with that probably if I needed to leave my pack for whatever reason. Um, but for me, I mean, I really try to identify whether the animal is a buck or a doe when it's coming in, because here in Virginia, especially when you're hunting in you know June, July, when those bucks are start growing their, their antlers, it's really, really, really hard to tell. And any animal who in, in Virginia, if you're hunting antlerless only deer, an antler deer would be a, a deer that has had its antlers break the skin line. Oh. And it is really, really, really hard to see those antlers when the deer's got their ears up, kind of moving around, and it's only a one inch or, or two inch kind of furry nub. Um, it's really easy to get lost. So I, I try to really identify my target uh, while it's walking in. And and that glass is, you know, invaluable when it comes to that. Yeah, definitely with those regulations. I want to be yeah, there. <laughs> kind of kind of goofy, but uh, yeah. especially when you're trying to reduce deer numbers, you think they wouldn't want to limit it. But yeah, uh, the guys in Virginia have such a hard time because, you know, we don't have we have it broken up by counties, but in southwestern Virginia, I mean, you could hunt all year and see maybe one or two deer. I mean, wow. the deer numbers in southwestern Virginia, kind of down around that Tennessee, Kentucky uh, state line, I mean, the deer population is, is incredibly scarce. Hmm. Versus up here, I mean, we need to kill anything and everything we see. So um, the the Virginia you know, Department of Game and Fisheries, they really have – uh, a tough job when it comes to setting bag limits and seasons and, and trying to do what they need to do in both those areas to get the deer to the proper sustainable numbers. Yeah. Well, we've been, um, we've been yakking at it here for a while is, and we've covered a, a whole bunch of different stuff. Is, is there anything we're leaving out on, on how you're getting it done? No, I mean, uh, really, the the key for me is talking to homeowners. I mean, just just talk to them, ask them where they're seeing deer, when they're seeing them. Uh, I I find the wind is the best thing for me to play. I I think the deer move a lot based on the wind. Just they like to know what they're walking into. So if you kind of know where they're coming from and and you know where they're going to bed, all their bedding is obviously wind specific. And if you start paying attention to that i think that you know anybody whether they're hunting public land in in the middle of nowhere or the suburbs and everywhere in between uh you can really up your game by by figuring out how deer bed and why other than that i mean uh keep playing with gear and and trying to figure out what works best um you know i i really think the I'm a big fan of, of high front of center number, like 15 to 17% FOC and, and a heavy arrow. Uh, and, and practice makes perfect. Outside of that, just trial and error. Well, I want to, um, I thought it would be interesting given that you have 
uh, so many hunting opportunities over such a, a, a good amount of time that uh, it'd be interesting to hear kind of uh, a good hunting story or maybe like your most memorable hunting story and then maybe one that didn't go so well um, and, and kind of see what your thoughts were there. Yeah. Um, well, well, we'll start with the bad one. I mean, there was, uh, we, we were talking earlier about, um, about interacting with, with homeowners. I was, my truck was in the shop for some reason and I have a, an old, uh, Jeep Wrangler that I restored. And so I took the Wrangler out to hunt and, um, it was a great morning. I shot four deer I had to drag them all back, got them gutted, got them loaded up in my truck, and they were kind of loaded like almost vertically, right, with their legs up in the air, and it just they were stacked in my Jeep. Um, and so I went to, uh, I think I went to Starbucks, got a cup of coffee, and I was driving home to start uh, processing all these deer. And I'm at a traffic light, and I got music kind of, you know, not cranked up, but I'm having a great morning, you know. And, uh this lady at the light next to me looks over at me and just like, looks at me like I am Satan in the flesh. And I'm like, what's this chick's problem? You know, and she rolls her window down and she goes, does that make you feel good? And I was like, huh? And I, I don't know why, but I just totally didn't realize that she could see the deer's legs that were sticking up behind me. Oh. And, um, I thought she was talking about my music cause I'm so used to driving my truck and, and my truck has one of those tonneau covers on it, so you can't, I just throw them in there and you can't see. And uh, I was like, what? She goes, does that make you feel good? I was like, yeah. You know, I thought she was talking about the song. I'm listening to, like, some pop tune. And she went off screaming at me, like, you know, F you, got out of her car. She got her finger in my face and the light's green. And, and all of a sudden, I catch, you know, something about murderer or talking about, you know, my manly hood or whatever. And I, I, it occurs to me that there are deer stacked in my truck that she can see. And, um, it's just not a good morning after that. I just yeah. felt terrible because I, I mean, I try to be very out of sight, out of mind. I, I don't want to advertise what I'm doing in any way. Not that I feel like what I'm doing is wrong because I know it's not, but I, I just, I know that some people are adamantly opposed to it. And so I vowed to never take my Jeep on, on another hunt again wow. because uh, it's just not the right vehicle to, to have four, uh, four deer in, especially, I mean, I didn't have the top on. It's like September is perfect weather and, you know, whatever. But uh, for feel good stories, I mean, I love taking people that have never been exposed to hunting, that have never, never ever had any interest in hunting and letting them you know try deer meat or or teaching them how to shoot so i recently had a a friend of a friend that really wanted to get into hunting um i found him a bow for a really good deal got him all set up with a bow and arrows and got him tuned up and we spent all summer shooting shooting arrows at my house and working on form and then teach him how to climb a tree and just literally every aspect of it. And, uh, I was with him last September when he harvested his first deer and watching him shake and, and just go through that whole rush of emotions that, you know, we've all been through, uh, you know, thousands of times, um, watching him get to experience that and just literally know that he is now hooked for life, um, was awesome. So I, I really enjoy, you know, teaching people, helping people learn, helping people get on deer. I mean, uh, I, I have, I really, really enjoy that because I've shot enough deer. I, I really, like, I love it. I, you can't keep me out of a tree and there's nothing I'd rather do, but, um, I really love kind of passing that torch or lighting that fire and in, in somebody else and, uh, and watching them, you know, get hooked as well. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds, um, you know, I think that's a common bond that, uh, that most hunters share and that's, it's, we need it. You know, we need more, more people to support what we do. So appreciate you, uh, you reaching out to non hunters like that and, and trying to convert them. <laughs> um, well, 
we, we've definitely jawed here for a while, and it's been a blast having you on. Uh, if you would, where can people find out more about you? Yeah, I mean, best way to find me is on Instagram. Um, I'm constantly updating my my story, and most of the time I'm in a tree. So uh, my my Instagram username is Urban Bowman. So uh, check it out, and um, you know, stay tuned for for more stuff to come. Anything that comes out on there, uh, or anything that I do further, I'll I'll put on there. So working on lots of short films for the upcoming uh, upcoming year with a group of guys that. Uh, we do a lot of filming and, and photography stuff with, uh, which is called Muddy Shutter Media. And, um, you yeah, know, they can follow that as well on Instagram and watch our content. Okay. Yeah, what I'll do for anybody listening uh, is in the show notes of this show, I'll put links to uh, Taylor's social media and over to to uh, Muddy, Muddy Shutter. Shutter Muddy? Yep. Muddy Shutter. Yeah, Muddy Shutter. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no worries. I was going to butcher something in there somewhere, so I might as well <laughs> save it to the end. Um, hey, save that for the deer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll put links in the description section down below so everybody can uh, can easily get to that. But, uh, Taylor, I really appreciate you coming on and, and taking time out of your schedule and, and talking some deer hunting with me. Anytime. I'm always happy to, uh, to talk deer. My wife will tell you that I do it too much. So. Wow. That's why I started a podcast because <laughs> <laughs> mine doesn't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> there you go. Well, if you'll uh, hold on the line for just a second, I'm going to wrap this up and then I'll get back on talk with you. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Thank you, sir. Well, there we go. Appreciate Taylor coming on the show and taking time out of his schedule to chat some hunting with me for a little while. Appreciate all of you tuning in, taking time out of your day. Hope you found some good information in here. I know I did. Uh, get out. You know, hunting season's coming up. Make sure you're getting your gear out, getting ready. I know I've been shooting my bow almost every day. I'm about, um, I don't know, 30 or so days, a little over. October 1st here in central New York uh, that we open. And then I've got an Ohio trip the first weekend in October. So I'm getting ready for that. Uh, I've been practicing with my sticks and stand every couple of days and just getting comfortable and working out all the kinks. So it's going to sneak up on you. Don't get complacent. Even if you're a gun hunter, get your gun out now and, and get it sighted in. Don't wait until bow season to get your gun sighted in. Uh, get it out. Get it going. Get your kids involved. Uh, get your nieces or nephews involved. Get somebody young out there and, and share your passion for the outdoors. Get family members out there with you. Uh, get your wife, uh, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend husband, fiance, doesn't matter. Get them all out there. Enjoy something in the outdoors, whether it be hunting, fishing, hiking, biking, running, uh, anything. Just get outdoors. Enjoy it. Fall's coming. Temperatures are getting cool. I know I'm, I'm itching for whitetail season with these, these cool mornings. Can't wait to get up in the tree stand and, and just hang out and, and listen to nature. Uh, be safe. Enjoy the outdoors. Until next time. Take care.